There might be more coming, we'll see, but let's start um, as we, we always will by, um, by remembering, by centering, by focusing on where we are in the, in the universe of souls, if you like, in the universe of mercy. Remember what we said last time, that, that um, it doesn't start with us and it doesn't end with us. That um, this life is not ours, neither to take nor to give. It's a, it's a gift of, of mercy. And by mercy, like I said last time, is mercy we can define as a gift that we never asked for, one that's just given without any requirements, without any conditions. Remembering that we'll never die because we were never born. We were always there, these souls. Uh, what is, is what will always be, uh, spiritually speaking, but not materially speaking. And that so many souls have made our existence possible. Not the least are yours, and, and I suppose mine. So I'm grateful to you for opening up and being here and, and passing along and thinking and exchanging. This is all part of the of the um, of the process then let's also remember uh keep in our minds um uh, gurudev sadhu maharaj gurudev's gurudev radha govinda das babaji maharaj let's remember bhaktivedanta Prabhupada, who's the author of the commentaries that we're reading and the translator of this version of bhagavad gita that we're reading Let's remember the Goswamis who helped us to understand and interpret the, the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Let's remember Radha Mohan, lastly. And remember the Acharyas, so the, the scholars and, and helpers that, have, that's, that accompany us in what we're doing. And let's remember each other as well. It wouldn't happen without you being here and wouldn't happen with, without the people close to you uh, being here, your families and friends and lovers. So we're a family, we're a spiritual family. And it's not limited to this group on the Zoom. It's a very big spiritual family that we're part of and we're all connected and it's that connection I tried to say last time, which makes everything happen. You are part of the parampara. Um, today, I think uh, we'll, I'll say a few more general things, maybe less and less general things, and then move to the more technical parts of the text of the introduction. And we'll, when we'll read some things together and and discuss uh, a few of of these. And then I want to remind you, sort of make a reminder of a couple of the really important themes from last week, so that they stay fresh and that they can be part of our 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 thinking our meditating and our reading as we as we go forward in terms of parampara the first thing to think of and to be conscious of and to be grateful for is that bhagavad gita doesn't start here obviously that's pretty obvious but it doesn't end here either and that's maybe less obvious that the, the power, the force of the spiritual message in Bhagavad Gita depends on what happens in this group and what happens in our family and what happens with it now. It will be passed on, it will be interpreted, and most of all, it will be lived. So it came to us by, through a kind of uh, succession, which is actually mentioned in on the very first pages of the introduction, the entire succession. Um, it's passed along from one heart to another, from one soul to another, one, from one voice to another. And what's really important about that idea of passing along, I said it before, sorry, but I think it's worth repeating, is that it's not the, the logic or the philosophy or the, the, even the substance of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the main event, but it's the way that it's passed along. It's the love that, that is required in order for it to be passed along. 
There's no communication without love. There's no communication without love, maybe on a very small, tiny degree, or maybe on a very huge degree. But unless you and I already have a relation, that we already have some mutual care, mutual respect, maybe mutual love, deeper love, there's no way that I will hear you or that you will hear me. So just the fact that Bhagavad Gita has passed down from for 4,000 years, from one heart to another, is a, a sign that there's love or some kind of care, uh, emotional relationship between those who speak and those who are spoken to. You know? It's the love through which it's transmitted, through, through which any spiritual message is transmitted. Um, that's important. So when we communicate, it's not like throwing a bowl. You know, I get rid of the ball, and now it's in your hands, and now it's not in my hands. No, there's like there's a there's a flow that we have to connect into, very much like the internet. Actually, Gurudev uses this example often. It's very much like the internet. The internet is flowing along right now, doing many many times of things, lots of work. But it's only until I connect my idea, my thoughts, my what's in my heart into the internet, into the flow that it can flow to you. And then you experience it through that flow. So the Zoom pictures you're seeing are not just a ball that I'm throwing to you. They're in a flow. They're in a flow of hearts and minds, which uh, has no beginning and, and has no end. It's a flow of energy, which was already there before you, before me. And we're making use of that. Uh, so through the mercy of whoever it is in your life who gave love to you, you're opening up to listen to me and to talk with others and to talk with your loved ones as well, maybe after the, after the, the lesson. And then it, it goes on and on in, in that exactly that way. So the flow of energy is already there. That energy is primarily love. I'll come back to that in a minute. And we attach our message to that. We hop on to that flow and ride it, and it's the love that brings us where we want to, to go. The flow is sometimes strong, sometimes weak. Maybe we're passionate about ideas. Maybe we're slightly indifferent. But in any case, unless, unless we have an emotional relationship with each other, there's no uh, communication happening um, at all. It's that connecting energy, which in Bhagavad Gita is described as love. And I'll show you I'll show you um, some examples of that in the text in, in a moment. It's described as love and it's described as Radharani. It's Radharani who is connecting us emotionally uh, one to the other. That connection, the model for that connection is the devotee relationship. That's the very first lesson of Bhagavad Gita. It's a les lesson of mm, a friendship between Arjuna and Krishna between an individual soul and the super soul, Atma and uh, Paramatma, between a disciple, a devotee, and, and, a, and a guru, uh, if you like. So you remember last time that Arjuna was described as a friend of Krishna, which is a very unusual thing to say in Western religions, in Islam or in Christianity, you would not see... Um, a regular disciple described as, as a friend. But this is not only something special about bhakti, but it's a requirement for understanding. We have to have the loving relationship in order to understand, in order to um, move forward. So it's only because there's a loving relationship between Arjuna and Krishna that Bhagavad Gita is even possible. It's only because Krishna loves him, Arjuna, that it's, that it's uh, possible. And this sort of connection, this love, in a way existed before we came, before Bhagavad Gita came. So to use kind of a technical word, the loving connection is the um, infrastructure of the universe. 
That's the basis that makes everything that happens um, happen. It's the internet of the world, to use Gurudev's uh, example. If there's experience, if there's communication, it's because the love is already in place, making the contact between real people um, happening. Another example that our Gurudev likes to use, um, and it's more than an example that's so strong, it's the example of um, Jesus, the relationship between Jesus and God in the, in the New Testament, in the Christian New Testament. Over and over again, this relationship is described as one of a loving parental one. Jesus loves his, the God like his father, the God loves Jesus like a son. So it's not sort of an authoritative, tyrannical power relationship between God and the disciple. It's one of care and love. And it's only that way that the real religious experience can happen. It can't just be through authoritative rules, commandments, um, regulations, and the rest. The whole story of Jesus, the whole passion of Jesus Christ, is a story of the feeling of love between him and his father, the feeling of uh, not understanding what his father wants, the feeling of perhaps even the betrayal of, of the father. So exactly this, and I'll, we'll, go, uh, we'll go to the text now in a, in a second, is what is at the heart of, of um, devotional service, this idea of love between the devotee and the, and, the, and the guru or the god and the soul. So let's go back to the, um, the text now, and I'll share my screen and show you. There we go. And show you the text I'm, I'm thinking of. This is on page six of the introduction, a little bit farther than where we went uh, last week. Um, let's see. Do we have a um, Do we have a reader? Ida, do you feel like reading for us? Of course. Um, from where should I start? From there for Bhagavad Gita, where the green thing is, but slowly, slowly, because uh, Madhurya Das is translating. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita should be taken up in a spirit of devotion. Right, I stop you there, and you see where I outlined? Spirit of devotion means that it can only be taken up in this loving mood, a loving mood between the one who's transmitting Bhagavad Gita and receiving Bhagavad Gita. Sorry, thanks. One should not think that he is equal to Krishna, nor should he think that Krishna is an ordinary personality or even a very great personality. Lord Sri Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, at least theoretically, according to the statement, statements of Bhagavad Gita, or the statements of Arjuna, the person who is trying to understand the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you. Okay, so here I underlined personality, supreme personality. Why? Because um, Krishna is not a simple, impersonal, characterless, figureless, formless thing. Krishna has personality, has characteristics, has moods and has love so there's a big debate in the in the history of the study of Bhagavad Gita and, and other texts whether God is personal or impersonal and if you take a Mayaveda Buddhism perspective for example they would say that God is impersonal that one in order to reach God we must take away all the qualities of God so that we reach a kind of uh, divine and pure emptiness. But the, the sense of our interpretation is that God has a personality, and that personality is a loving one. It's one that's loving uh, his uh, devotees, and one who's seeking love. And then finally, in, uh, in the era of Mahaprabhu, 
uh, I'll come back to that, a God who is looking to experience love. So personality is a very special way of talking about God. It's a way that um, uh, Prabhupada always uh, translates uh, the Sanskrit, and it's the way that he interprets this entire Bhagavad Gita as one of a personal God who has a personal love and a personal kind of experience uh, of love. Okay, go on, Nida. We should therefore, at least theoretically, accept Shri Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. And with that submissive spirit, we can understand the Bhagavad Gita. Unless one reads the Bhagavad Gita in a submissive spirit, it is very difficult to understand Bhagavad Gita because it is a great mystery. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So, pardon me. Stop share. Yeah, I'm back. So what I wanted to emphasize here is this idea that both the two things that are underscored there. First, submissive. And this uh, has nothing to do with uh, power as much as it has to do with the idea that we surrender. That we surrender our, our hearts and minds to, to Krishna, that we don't force our intellect, that we don't try to be philosophers and logicians, that our experience of Bhagavad Gita is one of of reading it with our hearts, reading it with our with our with our souls, and that's what we mean by um, submissive. And then that's the only path towards a mystery. When was the last time a logical reasoning could uh, solve a mystery for you? A true mystery is defined as one where logic doesn't work. If we want to understand a mystery, we have to do it with our hearts, with our feelings, with our um, devotion. So this is really a strong way of saying that the path to enlightenment, the path to understanding even Bhagavad Gita, goes by way of the heart. And that we must find a way around our brains, which is very difficult, particularly in our time, when we think we understand everything and master yeah, everything. And the best, the number one way to do this, and I talked about it last time, it's worth picking up again, is through service, devotional service. And I think I defined it um, as any activity that we have that is done without benefit, no? without, uh, without profit, that we don't benefit from it personally. It's um, devotional service is service that's done for the other, for someone else. And you don't need to know who it is. It's done for God. It's done for your mother. It's done for your cat. Um, there are no instructions about it. There's no road map. There's no, there's no reason. There's no rule. We do it just to do it, to give of ourselves. It's the doing. It's the intention the pure intention of just wanting to do, which makes uh, service what it is, and that's what purifies our, our hearts. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely, since we can't explain it by some sort of logic, we can't say, I'll work for one hour if you give me a thousand rupees. It's a, it has a calculus of, it has a spiritual calculus instead. It has a way of justifying itself through spiritual relations. We serve each other just to serve each other. I mean, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. It's why you're here as well. It's a kind of service. Let's compare a disciple and a devotee. What's the difference between a disciple and a devotee? Well, a disciple, <clears throat> a disciple does what she's told, or he is told. A disciple follows orders, is loyal, shows loyalty and love by following the rules. A disciple does what I say, 
My disciple does what I say. A devotee does what I feel. A devotee feels what I want, what I need, uh, and does this. So a disciple relation is a relation of rules, of power, of law. And a devotee relationship is a relationship of love. I'm together with the one I'm serving. And if this is a very strong experience, if you've ever been with uh, sitting with Gurudev, like Punyam there is, I suppose, so right now at this moment, it's a very strong feeling that you don't follow the rules of service. You follow the mood of service. You follow the feeling of service. It's an experiencing of wanting to know the other, wanting to know the guru, whether the guru is my wife or, or my, 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 my actual guru or my boss, wanting to know what the feelings of that person are and then satisfying them without being asked. So an experience of identifying with the feelings of the guru, of the one being is served. It's something which happens without any request. I identify with you and I serve you automatically. Automatically. I give myself to you. I give myself to your needs. I give myself to the guru's needs, to God's needs, uh, as much as I can understand them. And really, you don't need to be a believer in any God to do this and to know the benefits, how good it feels. You can uh, serve a complete stranger on the street, someone you've never seen, a child you never met, and you serve and you see, see the surprise in their eyes that you did what they wanted you to do without them asking you. And this is your, this is an immediate contact with, with spiritual love. To live is to give. There you have it. Living as taking, living as consumption, one-sided consumption, just exhausts us. It wears us out in our hearts, makes us tired, and it makes the world tired. So the one, if we had to boil bhakti down to one word, here's the end of the, here's the, end of the course on the, on the only the second day. The one word which summarizes all of bhakti, it's yes. Yes is the word that runs, that runs uh, the universe. In order to be able to say this yes to our God, to our guru, to our lover, to our friend, we need to become ourselves. When we talk about giving, we're giving of ourselves. Naderade, may I ask a very, very basic question? Absolutely. Um, now you said uh, we should do seva service automatically. And uh, I understand in my mind, of course, and the Shastra or Gudeva always says you should do automatically. But um, we are beginner in Jap many Japanese are some beginner. So sometimes, especially me, I feel um, there's many things to do for Jananda Maharaj here. But today I got tired <laughs> or today I want to do something for myself. So I know it's better to go to Jananda Maharaj's place, but... And I have many reasons. I can create a reason to not to do. But um, in that case, how can I, how can I say, um, automatically cannot come, the disabled <laughs> cannot come to automatically. <laughs> so, yeah. So in that case, in that moment, in that level, what should I do? Hmm. What should we do? That's a very beautiful question, Ramadhyaya. Thank you so much. I think everybody understands. Um, well, let's take it two ways. One way is to say that 
if Jayananda Maharaj knew that you came to his house to serve him because he thought you it was your job, that it, it was your obligation, he would be unhappy. He would not feel served because he would not feel your love. The reason he accepts your service is to accept your love. That's the one side from Jainanda's, from this person who served side. The side from your side, what, what is important about service is that it comes from your heart and not from the rule book, not from the law book. That uh, it says, well, I should help Jainanda with this and that on that time and this day. If your in intuition is good, if your intention is good, then your service is good. It has to come from your feelings. And if it's not there, there's no sense in just following the rule. Yes, I understand. But, you know, there's a two feelings. I want to go, but I want, I don't want to go, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's an, um, the feelings is coming up, down, up and down. And this moment, um, like, um, well, I can maybe go and a bit. I I know that Jana Maharaj will please to go and eat dinner with them. But um, yeah, my feeling is half go, but half not go, or something like that. So maybe many many savers. Um, you know, mm. if there's some many every day, there's many savers, and um, and also I have a job, and I I think. There's many reasons not to go or, of course, to go. And there's a love to go or Janan Maharaj have a love. You can you can come, you can not to come if you are tired or if you have something. There's a love also. But, um, yeah, I always thinking today, what should I do? <laughs> I, think yes. we, I think we all know what this means, yes. But the two different feelings you have are relationships to two different Mm, I almost want to say gods, or at least two different uh, two different uh, people. The one is the relationship to to your to your inner feelings for for your guru, and the other is a, a relationship to your inner feelings to the rule book, what you promised maybe, or what you agreed to and on paper. And once again, if you come with just the obligation in your heart, just the law, the rule then the love won't be received. So you're far better in uh, following the, um, the loving approach. Yeah, so if I, uh, I'm going to say, I don't want to go because I got tired or something, and just wait, can I just wait for, you know, one week, two weeks not to go, <laughs> if I, my feeling is not to go? Or, um, you know, if I know it's a, not the rule, but I just thought should do, but better to do, not to mm -hmm. on, not only go to Janan Maharaj's place, but just do the seva or service. I'm always wondering, just waiting is maybe I don't do anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I just feel like I'm yeah. just waiting is not maybe not um good for and um, going up to the the feelings so how can we developing the feelings to we, if there's less feelings here to be sure i don't know i don't know i cannot say but to be sure what i do know is that seva is a practice of love and if the, the love isn't there naturally, nobody will be fooled. Not you, not your heart, not the one you're serving. So certainly you, you cannot go and you cannot do seva, pure seva, unless there's love in it. You can't sweep the floor unless you love sweeping the floor. Well, you can do it or not, but if you, if you don't uh, feel that, then you cannot move on. Rade, rade. Now I come to answer this. Thank you. Why I don't want to go because 
missing of intimacy. Second thing, why come in picture then is good to understand. Come, intimacy is missing. Right? Independency is there. Intimacy is not there. I do not say I'm uh, Krishna say he is my intimate friend. Intimate was to Arjuna. Intimate friend is he understand my feelings. And I understand his feelings. Right? When I understand his feeling, that is intimate friend. Friend and intimate friend, there are two things. So he is my friend, but not very intimate. So more than that, some other place is intimate. Right? Important work than him is there. So my independence is there. I am marginal also. Here and there thinking. I am not only thinking for you. I am not become one pointed for you. I have to check myself what I have to improve it. Right? So yes. marginal is there, ping pong is there, intimacy is not there. And I am conditioned with some circumstances that I want to do first than others. So what is the priority? My condition is my priority. Not you are my priority. Right? Yes, good Dev. So you will say this is love? No. There is no condition in love. No ping pong in love. Right? See the teaching of Jesus. He never become ping pong. The priority of Jesus is the Father. His Abba was a priority. Right or not? The worst of intimate friend is my priority. It depends upon the person to person how deep my intimacy is. Right? Thank you. Clear? This yes, is the Parampara. This is the lineage given by Prabhupada and lovers. And this is the way of devotion. Devotion only comes in relation and love. Is it okay? Yes, now I can go back. Don't hide. Please. That is why I am there. No? Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Gurudev was, Gurudev was always there, even when he was not there, he was there. But if you are not there, then you are not there. Now Suniti comes. Why are you not there? Because you are not there. I want to give you that feeling. It's impersonal and personal. I was and cooking, Gurudev. No, cooking and listening. Yes. That is not your job. That you not cook. You are cooking for your mom and Radha. So why not? I will show what I am doing service. That is devotion. Be personal, not impersonal. That is the way of love. Right? Madhuri Alasa, Rice, Kishori, I cannot ask to others who is not personal. Right? Thank you. <laughs> you see, I am personal, I am listening, and so beautifully sharing. You see, I when I share Bhagavad Gita word to word, I explain the meaning of the words and I keep that words, then there is no problem with happening. I can answer because these words is giving answer to me. Rather. Thank you. Rather, rather. We'll carry on knowing that Gurudev is there uh, holding our holding our hand. What I want to do next was um, uh, go to what uh, Bhagavad Gita says about Swarupa. Because we talked many times now about giving of ourselves when we do service, uh, being our, ourselves when we're when we're generous. And, and also this strange paradox that the more we give of ourselves, the more we become ourselves. And this is all built around the idea of Svarupa, the, the eternal nature of the self, the transcendental form of the self, our eternal, eternal identity, who we really are, essentially, when we're when we clean away all the material covering and the material identity, then what can emerge is our svarupa, our eternal, transcendental, spiritual form. And here too, the, um, the idea of um, mercy applies because our svarupa is not something we have to go out and find, to look around and ask some people and maybe buy it or trade for it. No, nothing like this. Svarupa we already have. Everyone has a transcendental, eternal, spiritual self. The challenge is that we cannot see it. It's covered. We don't know it. We don't know our ourselves. We don't know our um, Sarupa. So it's not something out there, it's something in here. Uh, it's not something that needs to be given by another, though many people, and above all the Guru, can help us to, to find it and to, to understand it. But we already have it. We never uh, didn't have it. The problem is to, to, to find it, to uncover it in, from behind the material energy. So Bhagavad Gita says a lot about this. Let's go back to the introduction and see what it says. So here we're on page four and five. It's right after the bit we read last, last week. Um, Ida, do you want to carry on there slowly? Yes, of course. 
just let me know if it's too fast or too slow. Arjuna was in a relationship with the Lord as a friend. Of course, there is a gulf of difference between this friendship and the friendship found in the material world. This is a transcendental friendship which cannot be had by everyone. Of course, everyone has a particular relationship with the Lord, and that relationship is evoked by the perfection of devotional service. But in the present status of our life, we have not only forgotten the Supreme Lord, but we have forgotten our eternal relationship with the Lord. Every living being, out of many, many billions and trillions of living beings, has a particular relationship with the Lord eternally. That is called Svarupa. By the process of devotional service, one can revive that Svarupa, and that stage is called Svarupa Siddhi, perfection of one's constitutional position. So Arjuna was a devotee, and he was in touch with the Supreme Lord in friendship. How Arjuna accepted this Bhagavad Gita should be noted. His manner of... Ex mm. That's good. Thank you. Thanks so much. So you have everything in a nutshell here. It's really beautiful uh, passage from Prabhupada. Just now, Gurudev mentioned the relationship of the Lord with a friend, as a friend. So it's not a mechanical one. It's not one of authority. It's one of love. And there are different levels of love. Actually, it's just above here, isn't it? The, there are the different levels of loving devotion from the passive to the active, to the friend, to the parent, to the conjugal. So there's this friendship, this spiritual friendship that Arjuna feels with God, one that's the, 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 based on the devotion, loving devotion, which is different than the kind of friendships that we have in the, in the material world. It's transcendental. And because it's transcendental, it's linked to the Svarupa, the transcendental self or the transcendental form, if you like, the eternal um, nature. It can't be had by everyone. It can only be had by those who surrender and those who develop uh, devotional relationships with, uh, with others, who seek to, as it says, perfect their devotional relationships. The reason for Krishna appearing in Bhagavad Gita, coming to tell Arjuna this story, is that we've forgotten. This is a theme that comes up very often. We've forgotten this relationship. We've forgotten our svarupa. We've forgotten our, that we have a soul. Gurudev likes to cite Mary Magdalena, who said, the only sin in humankind is to forget that we have a soul. So the part of the task of Bhagavad Gita is to remind us. And indeed, the first um, six chapters are all about explaining to Arjuna the way that he and all jivas, all individual living beings, have a soul, but they are not their egos. They are not who they perceive their themselves to be in the material world. So that's what the next line says. Every living being has a particular relationship with the Lord eternally, a particular svarupa. It's particular in the sense that it's different for everyone. It's different for, it's, uh, it's personal, it's personifying. And we can increase that. We can increase our knowledge of it, and we can deepen our, our sense of our own Svarupa. And that process is called Svarupa Siddhi, or per, per, uh, perfection of the, of the Svarupas, perfection of the, um, of the, uh, of the transcendental form. And as Prabhupada says then, by, by perfecting that, by developing our devotional relationship uh, with God and with others, we can perfect our constitutional positions. Now, what does that mean, constitutional position? That's a very strange word. 
it's also one, one that uh, Gurudev underlines over and over again in our, in our learning. It's the position from which we start. It's our basis. It's our foundation, our constitutional position, the position that is the real us, the beginning, what makes us what we are. And so there we have to jump over to, <clears throat> let's see, one of Gurudev's most famous favorite, sorry, uh, but, um, citations right at the end, the very last verse of Bhagavad Gita. So here's the verse, and then we'll look at the purport. So this is verse 78 of chapter 18. I'll just take my shelf, self, Ida. <laughs> Wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, and where there, wherever there is Arjuna, the supreme archer, the warrior, there will be opulence, victory, extraordinary power, and morality. In other words, the emphasis here is on the and. Whenever they are together, whenever they are linked through love, through devotional uh, relationship, there, there will be greatness. It's this relationship between them, between God and Arjuna, between um, uh, uh, the, the super soul and the soul, that there will be greatness, opulence, victory, power, and morality. And then the bit that we often cite in our lessons with Gurudev is here. Now, do you want to read a bit, um, Ida, from Bhagavad Gita? From your marker, Peter? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> from Bhagavad Gita, we can understand that to realize oneself by philosophical speculation and by meditation is one process, but to fully surrender unto Krishna is the highest perfection. This is the essence of the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, the path of regulative principles according to the orders of social life and according to the different courses of religion may be a confidential path of knowledge in as far as the rituals of religion are, conf are confidential. But one is still involved with meditation and cultivation of knowledge. Surrender unto Krishna in devotional service, in full Krishna consciousness, is the most confidential instruction and is the essence of the 18th chapter. Thank you. So this is the top of the top of the top of Bhagavad Gita. We cannot find our way there by following the rules and regulations, by respecting only the material authority of the law books and the rule books. We can only find our way to our svarupa, to our transcendental self, our identity, by surrendering. That is, by giving ourselves over to a loving devotional relationship to God uh, and others. We'll go on, uh, Pita. Another feature of Bhagavad Gita is that the actual truth is the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna. Absolute truth is realized in three features, impersonal Brahman, localized param, Paramatma, and the para, supreme paramatma. paramatma, and the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna. Perfect knowledge of the absolute truth means perfect knowledge of Krishna. If one understands Krishna, then all the departments of knowledge are part and parcel of that understanding. Okay, I can, I can try to explain a little bit these technical uh, terms. So there are three parts to the absolute. One is the impersonal Brahman, that means the absolute reality. Brahman is absolute reality. Some understand that as impersonal God. So the God without any sort of loving dimension, any devotional dimension, just absolute reality. Paramatma is super soul, so the spiritual side of, of God. And then thirdly, the personality of God, the part that has the loving dimension, the, 
the the, um, the the enjoying dimension. So all three of these together, we have to understand, and we have to place ourselves in this world in order to understand um, our souls. Some people are uh, prefer the impersonal Brahman idea. Some people prefer the Paramatma idea, the soul, the super soul. Others, the personality. We have to understand and and relate to all three of them. And that's what's new about Bhagavad Gita, essentially, that it's making an argument for exactly those that triple understanding. So let's jump down, Ida, to the absolute end of the Bhagavad Gita. Even before we read the first chapter, we take the last. So the living entity. The living entity in his original position is pure spirit. He is just like an atomic particle of the Supreme Spirit. The conditioned living entity, however, is the marginal energy of the Lord. He tends to be in contact with both the material energy and the spiritual energy. In other words, the living entity is situated between the two energies of the Lord. And because he belongs to the superior energy of the Lord, he has a par particle of independence. By proper use of that independence, he comes under the direct order of Krishna. Thus, he attains his normal condition in the pleasure-giving potency. Very nice. Thank you. What does this mean? The living entity in his original position is pure spirit. Pure spirit is what we are. This is what we are originally, authentically. It's not, again, again, like I said before, it's not that we need to go out and find our pure spirit. We are already that. We need to go back to it. We're in a, we're in a situation, most of us, of wandering, of being away from who we are. But our normal position, our base, base position, is pure spirit. And this is a very beautiful and very promising idea. It says to us that we all possess pure spirit, but they were a bit lost along the way. We've forgotten, as uh, Bhagavad Gita says it. The normal condition is the one where we are in this, in our Svarupa. And what, what we need to do now is find the right way to, to get back to that, to leave behind us the marginal energies, the material energies, and find our way back to the, the normal. So the people are spiritual beings in their normal, normal form. I'm watching the clock a little bit. I don't want to keep you too long, but we can't go on without saying something about pleasure giving potency. I always thought this was a very strange expression, and you see it uh, very often in, in Bhagavad Gita. Pleasure-giving potency. What is that? Pleasure-given potency is Radharani. I mentioned it last week. It's never said in Bhagavad Gita a couple of times in the introduction. Pleasure-given potency uh, is Radharani. Radharani is, is the shared part of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when Mahaprabhu appears, he has a double form when he appears at the end of the 15th century. He has a double form of Radha and Mohan, the loving and the beloved. Uh, and the part that has the pleasure-giving potency is Radharani. So she's the one who is attractive to to the to Krishna, who is attractive to everybody, so she's the super. She has the superpower, if you like, even over uh, Krishna. Krishna enchants the world. Krishna attracts the world, but Radha attracts him. So he's the strongest, but somehow she has a kind of uh, power over him. And their love affair, the love affair that's played out in the. Viraj Leelas that we read about in Vilapa Kusumanjari and Radha Rasa Sudhamiti. This love affair is essentially the 
what our reality is. It's the basis. The normal condition, as Prabhupada says there in that last line, the normal condition of human life is the spiritual attraction, the divine attraction that we see, that we find at the heart of, of reality. Reality, the foundation of reality is love or a love affair, even if you like loving, uh, a loving uh, process. Maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe depending on, I'm going to unshare there. Maybe I could say a few words about, about the story of the Raj Lila and Radharani, because not everyone knows equally uh, about it. So maybe I'll close by just saying a few words um, uh, about that. Um, if there's a loving relation between anyone, if there's a loving energy between Arjuna and Krishna, between us and God, between us and, and Guru, between us and others, this energy in our inter interpretation is Radharani. The energy of loving devotion is Radharani, who's sometimes called the goddess of love or the, the goddess uh, of loving. So in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, what we say is that Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appeared around the end of the 15th century, was an incarnation of Krishna in two parts, as a kind of exploration of love, an experiment in love. Krishna became curious about love, about feelings, about love in the universe. So as the most famous biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells, uh, he came for three reasons. He reincarnated at the end of the 15th century for three reasons. Because having been loved by everyone as God, as the most beautiful and powerful God, he wanted to know what it was like to love God. He wanted to have the take the position of being the object of divine divine love. And then he also wanted to know what it was like to be a lover of God, the second reason. And then thirdly, he wanted to relish this idea of being attractive. So for these reasons, we say, in, in our tradition, Krishna reincarnated as Radha Mohan, Dada and Mohan, Radha and Krishna, to know in order to, to have these experiences, to have the experience of being loved, the experience of loving, the love, the experience of, of relishing. And this experience that, that is had is the energy of all loving relationships in the world. This pleasure-giving potency that's in the very last sentence of Bhagavad Gita is precisely the, this experience that is had by Krishna in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, it's a kind of pure loving, a pure, pure kind of uh, energy. So without that, without that, then the loving relations that govern the, the world, that govern our relations in, at small levels and at high levels, would not be possible. And that's why we focus so much on trying to understand this loving relation, to feel the loving relation, and to grow in our own love so we can be part of the loving relationship of, of, uh, of God. Mm. I wonder if I should stop there and see if there are any ideas you wanted to share, any thoughts or feelings you had of your own. We could read more text, but maybe this is enough for one day. Okay. Hare Krishna. A little bit bumpy, but yes. No, because uh, also you said that Brahmari is controlling the Krishna for the love. This is like the love is so powerful, you can even control God in a sense. 
and always really like this verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita Antya, 1818, which says also that Priya makes Krishna dance, makes the devotee dance, and all three are dancing in the same place. And this is, I always feel this is so, such a strong verse also, which shows that love is so powerful, so Prima is not, it's a Radhani in the sense, the Radhani is running everything in this sense. To her love, all the devotees, every being, everything, even, even God is doing just because of her love. This, yeah. I just want to share. <laughs> yeah, thank you. In the, in the chat there, Punyam put the, um, the verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is, for those of you who don't know, this is the biography of, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prema's love makes Krishna dance, makes the devotee dance, and dances itself. All three are dancing in one place. The most mysterious part of the verse is, how does love dance by itself? Yes, I dance for my lover, my lover dances for me, but love is all on its own dancing. That's quite, it's making the whole world dance. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. All right, then, well, I promised we'd finish the introduction, and we didn't, but uh, we had a very nice little exchange with, with uh, Ramani Kriya, which I'm very grateful for, and with Gurudev. Um, so next time we'll go, I promise we'll go straight to some more technical matters, which may be, you who have not read a lot, a lot of Bhagavad Gita are more interested in um, some of the definitions, Ishvara, Jiva, etc., and some of the basic ideas about what the material nature is and what um, what it means that God is. Uh, uh, we are part and parcel of God, and the contrary, and what consciousness is. So all these more sort of technical matters which come kind of directly from the Upanishads. We can we can take these up next time and. Uh, make some stronger coffee and 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 discuss them as well